So I, I think I'll remain seated. Um, I did, in case you'd like to look at this, I brought it for a reason. Um, it's a it's a cartoon book. A little bit longer. Um, is it? Can you hear me all right? Maybe a little closer. Okay. Uh, it's a cartoon book about Robert Parker, uh, with the um, seven deadly sins. Um, it will come up in a moment when I talk about it. Um, so let me just say uh, to start that there is one person more than anyone who we have not yet thanked uh, and should thank for uh, starting this organization and for organizing 10 meetings in a row, which is pretty amazing. Um, I can't even say I've been to all the meetings. Um, but I know one man here who has been to all the meetings, and that's our friend Carl. So would you join me? Stand up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, it was something that, that needed to be done. We only do one, um, uh, well, two now, but one afternoon of plenary sessions where we're all together. Uh, and that's the idea that we should present scientific papers, as many as we can, that have some interest. Uh, I thought I would just say a couple of things, uh, two things about, pe people ask me, and they perhaps they ask you, uh, what, what is uh, wine economics? What, what, what do you study? I think now we have an easy way to answer because we have the Journal of Wine Economics, which has been published for what's well, in its 11th, 11th the volume. I think the organization of the structure um, of our arrangements is um, optimal. It's basically um, the way that um, all of the famous things like the Econometric Society or the American Economic Association they're all organized along the same structure, uh, which is a not-for-profit organization that owns the journal. Uh, we then hire Cambridge University Press, basically we're a partner with them, uh, to publish the journal. But the control is in the hands of the academics. Uh, the problem with journals and other things is that they are mostly a waste, terrible waste. Um, you think of any journal you think of, owned by Elsevier or, or whatever you want, it used to be called North Holland. They, we edit the journals for free. We review the papers for free. We write the papers for free. And then they charge your library $1,000 to sell to you the information you created. <laughs> it's completely crazy. Completely crazy system. Uh, and it's absolutely impossible to stop it. There's nothing you can do. Um, all you, you can try, um, you know, Americans are supposed to be the great free market people, but actually we have, we, we're the only ones that don't have a free market, don't have pure public ownership of these journals because it's not sensible, it's not optimal. Um, in any event, uh, Carl, I think, appreciated the setup. So we actually have, I think, a structure that allows us to uh, survive. Uh, and it may survive for a very long time. I, I say that partly because, uh, you know, uh, Carl says I'm the father of wine economics. I've actually met one person at one of these meetings who, when I was introduced, said, oh my, you are alive. <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> I could be dead, I'm old. I could be dead, uh, <laughs> but I'm still alive. Anyway, so the structure, I think, is um, is been well, well arranged. Uh, Carl has been very careful about organizing the meetings uh, so that they're very scientific. Uh, and I think that we have a, uh, a basis for a kind of a, a way in which other parts of economics will evolve. Um, it, 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 every, the, the field is becoming such that uh, more, you, you can go to the best journal and try to get your paper published uh, and the referee won't know anything about what you did uh, because they can't find anybody who knows enough about what you work on to make any sense of it. 
Um, and eventually, if it's a good paper, it will get published and probably in a journal like the Journal of Wine Economics. We have some remarkable papers. Um, I used to be, uh, Robert Parker was my nemesis. Uh, he hated me, uh, despised me. And I think he, because he, he understood a great deal about Bordeaux and even about how to rate the wines, but he didn't like the idea that we would use science to think about the fundamentals of wine. And there's a reason. The reason is that when Parker does it, he collects all the revenue associated with telling someone if the wine is any good. With science, everybody collects. There's no, there are no, we don't have a patent on science. The science is supposed to be for everyone. We share it. We don't have secrets. He, of course, had secrets. He knew that the weather affected the, 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 the vintage in Bordeaux. Everybody in Bordeaux knows this. He knew that. He asked people what was it like, and then, and then produced these completely fake descriptions of what the vintages are, um, which is ridiculous in a way, uh, but it meant that he could collect money. If you do it the scientific way, it, everybody, the, the consumers collect the money. We have to organize ourselves so that we, we produce more information. So now we have a good journal. We have some incredibly famous papers in the journal. Bob Hodgson, who is here, uh, there's a whole book, a half a book written about Hodgson by George Tabor uh, on his uh, phenomenal field experiments. Uh, well, his great field experiment in, in, in inserting um, replica wines in a, a tasting panel and studying the results of that and finally getting, getting it published and even being willing to circulate that data. That's an amazing piece of work. Um, so there's lots of, we now have very good, good work, good papers. Um, people often ask me, so what is wine economics? I think it's the same as anything. We apply economics um, to a particular product. Historically, in the field of industrial organization, it was normal to have a, the to understand about economic theory, but to have uh, something where you applied things, so you kept yourself uh, under control. So you might be someone who studied cars. You might be someone who studied airplanes. And I think of it, us the same way. We are people who study wine. Uh, and we use the, the tools of economics. Uh, we study the production and distribution of uh, a particular type of good. And we use the tools of economics to do that. So there's nothing unusual or, uh, about that at all. I do think we have some topics that are special that are, um, they are uniquely interesting to people who study wine economics. When people ask me about what the subjects are, I often give these two examples. Uh, one is the subject of understanding the fundamentals. So for example, uh, Philippe just spoke about the, uh, the Grand Cru Classe. This is a, a, the group that was, uh, and I thought a very lovely explanation too based on prices established a long time ago. And that gave a rank order. Um, it does not actually tell you what the price will be. The level of the price is not established that way. And the gap between the top and the bottom is not established that way. It just gives you an order. But uh, the interesting question that an economist would then ask is, well, why is Lafitte number one? And I think he owns Bataille number in the third category. Why is that? What's the fundamental? Presumably, we think that the wines are better, and the explanation must have something to do, not, it can't be just the man, probably, because if, if it was just the man, well, Mr. Bataille can hire Mr. Lafitte, and he could produce the same wine. But apparently, that's not possible. So uh, there's something about fundamentals, and I think that this is the, the reason it's important, the fundamentals, is not just as an abstract idea, uh, I was, a lot of, many of us have been interested, Victor Ginsburg, Kim Anderson, a lot of us have been interested in the fundamentals. But the reason we're interested really is for something which is not necessarily in the interests of the people that we study, whose work we, whose vineyards we study. And that's, that, and that interest we have is to use this, if we use maybe a hedonic approach, to use that information to determine whether or not and what we can grow in other places. So, the, in other words, you can ask yourself, 
uh, as I did in Los Angeles, <laughs> where I have a vineyard, by the way, which is not as big as this floor, 1,500 square feet. Terrible news yesterday, it was 109 degrees and some of my grapes are dehydrating. My daughter was frantic. I have a grandson who takes care of the thing. He's 12 years old. He's frantic. <laughs> um, we can't have DDI. I have to put more water. Do something. Um, the, uh, so how did I do that? Well, I used some fundamentals. Uh, we planted Cabernet, actually. But we, we used some fundamentals. And the idea is that if, if you understand the fundamentals of what it takes to grow different kinds of grapes and make different kinds of wine, then you can, you can spread that information. You can take it to other places. You can take it to places that perhaps didn't make quality wine. Those are the ones that were in the Soviet bloc, uh, Poland and Czech Republic and Slovakia, where everything was communized and everything was designed to be low quality. But there's that once once the communism goes, they can they can make higher quality wines and compete with uh, Alsatians or whoever. Uh, so one, one thing I think is many of the papers, you see this, have to do with the fundamentals uh, of the product. Uh, and that topic, I think, is never ending. We never really stop talking about that. Um, a second subject that, that everyone is interested in, I think, deeply interested in, uh, is the subject that's raised by this, by this book, which is uh, the role of expert opinion. Um, the role of the expert opinion is in part to spread information, but also in part to make people knowledgeable about things that they would never have known. But that's one thing it does. The, the other is that it also involves setting the prices. So the role of expert opinion, uh, I think it, it's, you can see this is, this is deeply fundamental. So in the financial crisis, many people like Joe Nocera, the New York Times reporter, he blamed the financial crisis on Standard & Poor's, on Fitch, on the rating agencies, who uh, would rubber stamp the asset and say that it was good, even as the asset was collapsing. There's a sense in which, in, in wine, we have a little better control. Many times there's no, you know, your sovereign bonds, if you come from a country like Croatia, your sovereign bonds are rated by Standard & Poor's. The interest rate you pay is determined by a guy on Wall Street. So it's a big deal. It's this Robert Parker on a really big scale. Well, we, we may ask the question, do they know anything? Do they add any information? Uh, so I think the role of the expert is, is especially relevant in, um, in um, especially relevant in wine. It, it also probably gives us a place to use our techniques and study the problem where nobody becomes too angry with us for what we find, um, so we can have a good time, laugh, and drink some wine. Um, let me just mention two subjects that, one I tried to get our uh, uh, Philippe Caseja to talk about, but he didn't, uh, two, and another one. I think there are two things that are probably most interesting, and in I can see them in one in particular, shows up in many of these papers. Um, there is a kind of a social or cultural movement in the world that is, we are re-urbanizing. You can see this in most places. People like, I was here last night, my God, <laughs> too many people. Um, there is a, Brooklyn is now incredibly expensive. Brooklyn used to be a slum. Um, Los Angeles is coming back. There, there are two things going on. One is this urbanization, people, but there's another one, which is at the same time, People want to know more about what they eat and drink. There's a locality factor. There, there's a sense in which people want, this is, a, this is by the way, is something that's a, a verse to Bordeaux. Bordeaux uh, is, is the great example of an export product. Most of the Bordeaux is not drunk in Bordeaux, drunk somewhere else. But there is a movement, there's no question about it. There's a movement everywhere to have local products, to understand, meet the farmer know who he, what he was, find out why he's doing what he does, understand if he's organic, if he's not organic, why is he not organic? And maybe, maybe he cannot be organic. Um, so there is, a, there is a local thing. And one of the most interesting things to me, it's a new thing for me, is in the United States there are 50, all 50 states have wine. And most people, especially supported by the people that write about wine, 
like the Wine Spectator and Robert Parker. These people only write about wines that are not local. They write about wines, they never write about local wines. Uh, so now I have just switched. I was drinking New Jersey Chardonnay. New Jersey Chardonnay, we had the judgment of Princeton. New Jersey Chardonnay is now getting too expensive. So I've switched to Michigan Chardonnay. <laughs> and the, it turns out, if you don't know this, I'm sure you don't, the Lake Michigan Shore is an appellation. It has the lake effect. It's 10 degrees warmer in the winter and 10 degrees cooler in the summer. Within 10 miles of the lake, you can make very nice, cool climate wines. And quite nice Chardonnay for much less than New Jersey. Now, be, being a farmer in New Jersey myself, I'm in favor of high prices. <laughs> I favor the higher the better. Because the farmer, the farmer needs the high prices. The farmers need the high prices. And moreover, they probably need more direct distribution. Because if you think about the system Bordeaux has here, it's an incredibly expensive distribution system. There's so many people involved. You have to pay all those people to distribute the product. So it's a system that can't really work for local products. For local products, the farmer has to collect most of the money. If you think about the Bordeaux wine that you have, they actually do a pretty good job of collecting a large fraction of the wine. But in a normal, in a normal bottle of wine, the wine is uh, you know, a $25 bottle of wine. The grapes cost $5. The farmer gets nothing, really. So the farmer needs to capture that. And I think that will be a new thing everybody will be, I, 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 think it's, I don't think it's stoppable. I think it's going to happen everywhere. Because people everywhere want to know more about their farmer. They want to know more about the man who makes the products that they consume. Um, the second issue I wanted to bring up, which, which I tried to get Mr. Castaneda to, to talk about, but he didn't, is that if, if you look at the top price of, of the Bordeaux, so go to Lafitte. They just released their their on premier price, which you can't buy for this, but the broker pays, is something like 384 euros a bottle. I think Lafitte, and now that's, I think that was Mouton and, uh, and Latour. Lafitte is maybe 400, they have to be a little higher. So maybe they're 415. I'm, I'm off a little bit, but close enough. So these are 400 euros a bottle. 400 euros, and that wine, that's long before it gets to you. Now if you look at the bottom, Take little chateaus, like the ones I drink, Chateau Menet. Uh, I don't know if they even enter on, on Premier, but probably the thing is 10 euros. Now, the gap, the gap between Lafitte and a good wine, that gap has become enormous. The, I mean, you could take it more generally, the Grand Cru Classé, the gap between them and the others has become enormous. But even within the Grand Cru, it's spread out. This is inequality. We actually have an opportunity with wine to study inequality. We have inequality. Just like inequality has increased in wages, it's also increased in wine prices. Now, why is that? We don't know for sure why. Uh, and, and in a way, it's a good place to study the question. Because when you talk about inequality of wages, well, people say, skill bias, technical change. Well, do we think that's true for wine? I don't think so. The guy who makes the best wine is now more skilled than the guy who makes the, the, the uh, fourth growth or the fifth growth? I don't think so. But the point is that it gives us a chance to study something. And I notice there's not much discussion of that topic. But it is probably the most interesting subject, uh, when you think about it, where you can use the Bordeaux classification and, and the very available data on prices you can use that to study a question that's of much bigger interest. Much bigger interest. This is, there are other examples of this. For example, the rich, the richest people now live longer. The gap between the richest and the poorest in their lifespans has grown. This is not only true for people, it's also true for dogs. The dogs of the rich people live longer than the dogs of the poor people. <laughs> Now, so you, if, the, if there's an explanation for people, it should include dogs. <laughs> anyway, I, I give that example because the way to motivate research can sometimes be very unusual. And I think, we, I think I've done about enough.